Hi, everyone. Welcome to the June meeting of the Scarlet Quill Society here at Yeah Right. Um, we're on YouTube, so do the like, the subscribe, all of those things. Um, we do meet every month, but it's a little bit irregular because we try to accommodate our speakers. So obviously, hit the bell button. Is it? It might be there. It might be there. I don't know. I'm bad at YouTube. Um, if you don't want to miss a meeting. Also, make sure that you are subscribed to our newsletter, getting our updates, links in our bio. And this month, I am really, really excited for a meeting because we're going to talk about a topic that is, I think, near, if not dear to most writers' hearts, which is, holy crap, submissions. Um, as we go through our year of tropes, uh, we thought it would be interesting to explore We've talked about tropes as building blocks. We've talked about tropes as um, necessary ways to get you from point A to point B. In May with Cat and TC, we talked about tropes that actually do harm in the real world um, and why you should use them. And this month, um, you get to see Jennifer, Sue, and I have a submissions editor gripe fest about tropes that we would love to just never read. Um, but before we do that, I do wanna do our land acknowledgement here at Yeah Right, because as we move towards these virtual communities and virtual meetings, I think it's important that we not forget that we still have a duty of stewardship to the land that we are on. And Yeah Right, as a corporation, as an organization, um, our deepest locus of connection to the land is on the traditional and current home of many, many peoples. We are at the confluence of several major rivers. So the peoples who live here are the Multnomah, the Wasco, the Cowlitz, Kathlamet, and Clackamas, the bands of Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalapuya, the Malala, and the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde have ties to this area. And as part of, part of our duty of stewardship, because acknowledgement without action is kind of just bragging about colonization. Um, yeah, right, donates to the Naya Family Center. Um, Naya provides culturally specific programs and services to guide people in the direction of personal success and balance through cultural empowerment. And we encourage you to do the same thing as part of your duty to the land that you live on. Um, find a, a comparable local organization and find a way to give back either with time, with money, or with raising awareness in the in the community around you. And Jennifer, I'm going to get out of your way and let you talk about where you're living. All right. I am currently sitting in Roanoke, Virginia, which is the ancestral land of the Yasong. Roanoke's very name is derived from a Powhatan word, Rawranok, a term meaning things rubbed smooth by hand, which was used to mean the shell beads made by peoples in this area for use as currency and decoration. And the city's earliest name, Big Lick, described the salt marshes where gathered the buffalo, elk, and deer that Native Americans from the Yasong, the Saponi, and the Okanichi hunted here. In addition, the state of Virginia was built by the labor of enslaved people and with the riches that their labor brought, the effects of which are still very clearly visible in the everyday surroundings of anyone who lives here now. Okay, so um, let's, let's go ahead and jump into our topic. Um, which is, have you as a submissions editor ever gotten in your work chat with the other submissions editors that you're working with and said, the narrator was the murderer all along. I never saw that coming. Holy crap, we need this story. I think uh, I have been in group chats that have these discussions every day during a submission period, uh, whether it's, you know, the one that we've all seen or just the one that we are seeing a lot of this submission period you know things seem to come in in rafts we keep yeah. tallying occasionally of okay this is another one of the the robot was the murderer okay right and, and it's like is everybody reading each other's stories and getting ideas from each other and then they're all submitting the same idea or is it just sort of in the zeitgeist and and here come 40 stories about child loss. It's so obviously right now we're seeing a lot of dark, dark stuff that's absolutely zeitgeist. Um, yeah, we're people are processing you know, an entire pandemic. People, people processing what has happened, what they've witnessed, um, the general social response to all of that. 
but something else that we see a lot is there's an anthology call for short stories about say there was one a while ago about uh horror stories that had to do with pizza sure everyone who submits to that anthology and doesn't get accepted is then going to shop those stories everywhere else and it doesn't seem that most people think i will sit on this story for a year it seems that most people think i will send this story out immediately so then we get 30 stories about horror and pizza um right because, because while authors all talk to each other and there's a community they still tend to think about themselves as individuals and this is my story that i'm submitting without necessarily thinking about the environment it's being submitted in. Right, so especially for something like NYC Midnight where those prompts are so specific, right? If you get 12 stories with a grandmother and a cuckoo clock and I don't know, a, a, a train whistle, like you kind of know, right? Right, uh, that's definitely something that um, and obviously I'm speaking only for myself here and not for any other submissions editor who I've worked with or I'm, I'm working with, but certainly there is back chat in, in the shared discord or the shared chat groups where, okay, I've seen four of these. Are you seeing a bunch of these? Because yeah. we don't want to pass up five submissions about grandma and a cuckoo clock to the acquiring editors. Right. We want to have the best one of those. So, so let's, if you... let's talk for one quick second then, um, because not everybody is familiar with how the submissions editor process works. So when somebody submits a story, it goes into a pool of stories and then it's read by like a first pass, um, depending on how popular the publication is. I know you read for a publication that gets tens of thousands of submissions. Um, Sometimes we will read for things like as a one-off, as a favor to a friend, something that's going to get maybe a couple of hundred submissions, 10, 20 even, um, smaller things like, I don't know, there was a, a pet charity thing I read for a while back that was like a, a deeply rural um, poetry contest for an animal shelter. And so they they got like, I think, 70 submissions total. And there were five of us reading. But so depending on how big it is, it's going to go to a slush editor or a slush reader and then maybe to a submissions editor and eventually to an acquisitions editor who is the person who makes the final decision. Right. And then none of these people are an editor the way that most people think of editors, right? None right. of them change your words. This is something that I've actually had to talk to authors about um, because there is this possibly kind of antiquated notion that you send your stuff to an editor and if your editor likes it they read pen it and they send it back and you make your changes but that is not the level i am at i am you know if you think about a filter i am the widest mesh i'm here to screen out um i'm here to screen out things with the obvious problems i'm here to screen out things that don't fit the market really well so that the editor, the acquisitions editors who have a limited amount of time on their plate, they're not going to see 10,000 submissions. They're going to see one in 20 to one in 30 of the submissions that I read. Um, right, so you have to make a decision fast. Yes, but frequently in the first or second paragraph, occasionally on the strength of the cover letter alone. And, and so like, that hurts me in the soul as a writer, but also as a submissions editor, I super, super get it. Um, I can usually tell within the first half page of writing if this story is going to be publication ready or if it just needs too much additional work. And at that point, guys, it, it will not matter how good your story is underneath. If it needs too much additional work, most markets are not going to take it. We just don't have the time. We don't have the resources to devote to um, fixing huge amounts of grammatical errors, that sort of thing. And when I say I have bounced stories surely on the strength of the cover letter, occasionally that is because the cover letter says, here is my photo essay on bugs in the Appalachians. Like, well, we don't do any of that. So that just gets discarded. Yeah. But yeah. So know your market, read your market. Right. But in the first couple of paragraphs, it usually becomes fairly clear if you are at the level that we are looking for. Yeah. 
and people can get to that level, right? Like they can get there on their own. It's not like, oh, you have to be the most perfectly talented writer that ever existed with completely original ideas. We're not asking for no tropes. We're not asking for perfect writing. What we are asking for is a thoroughly workshopped and beta edited story, a story that's had some passes of editing, a story that does not contain major grammatical errors, and a story that doesn't just replicate things that are exhausting. Right. It's if it is something, even if this is the only time I've seen this trope during this submission period, if I have seen this trope in the previous 15 submission periods and every time it's been like, okay, next we're going to find out that the person with a limp is secretly evil. There, I walk into it already tired. Yeah. You get like the lazy coding of characters right. like, oh, this character is ugly. Therefore, they're going to be cruel. Right. Here is a short, fat, jolly person. Here I want is... to be excited and surprised. And that doesn't mean that I want to be startled by what I read. But if there is, I see the beginning of a trope, I want its, it's exhibition I need to, in a new way. I need to something. either trust the reader or the writer going into that trope by the time they introduce it, trust them to resolve it satisfactorily, or they need to lampshade that immediately, right? Right, right. And Certainly, I have seen authors who were capable of building that trust in the first couple of paragraphs, or I've seen authors who I wasn't sure about, but okay, I'll give it a couple more pages, and yeah. then we'll see what happens. Um, you don't... The, I feel like that about our flag means death. <laughs> we're, let's just out ourselves. We are the world's biggest nerds. Oh, massively. Yeah, I don't know. The stuff in, my, in the back is not very clear right now. I here, just but want to get done with this and... so I can go play some more Zelda. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But I, I, I guess basically I don't want to be treading over ground that I've treaded a hundred times unless there is a good payoff for it. And you have to convince me that I want to walk to the payoff. And this happens fast, guys. It happens super, super fast. And one of the fastest ways that you can turn off a submissions editor, at least within the group of people that I talk to consistently is really tired phrasings. And let me just give the world's most harmless example of that, which is the just dead ass pet peeve of not me personally, but now that they brought it up, I see it everywhere and it has started to bother me immensely. A single tear rolled down her down cheek. Her cheek. <laughs> it is right up there with she let out a breath she didn't know she'd been holding. Yeah. And remember, these are always female characters. Always. Um, and so, um, so the single tear, I get it. It is a really effective way to show that someone is doing their absolute damnedest to suppress any possible emotion they are trying so hard to you know to 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 british up i don't know um but also it is in literally every story and it needs to stop there's there's like a phase you go through and you need to be done with it by the time you're out of 10th grade where the single tear rolls down the cheek um <laughs> Because once that stops being new to you, you need to recognize that it's not new to anyone. Right. And, and particularly when you consider the volume, submissions editors read for fun in addition to reading <coughs> submissions, right? Almost none, of us, almost none of us burn out on reading submissions and are just like, okay, I can't read anything anymore. So it means we're reading a lot of what is published previously, what is currently being published, and then yeah. what is being shot for publication. So we see the all the actually published experiences of this trope and then we see everybody who's riding on coattails or read it and it's stuck in their brain and they didn't realize that it wasn't new to them and so we're seeing all of it yeah yeah and so it's the same phrases over and over again and i gotta tell you um most of what i read for fun these days is fanfic because i can consume a large amount of it in a small amount of time and and in little nibbles and if you are a fanfic writer and you are submitting to a serious market, I know, 
I know it. Mm -hmm. Because each of your fandoms has a phrase that it overuses. And whether it's a phrase from the original medium that y'all borrowed and liked, or something that someone came up with. Um, my my go-to example, I'm going to out myself here. Um, I used to read a whole lot of Fury Road fanfic when that was a big thing. And at some point, someone in that specific fandom did not know the difference between plush and lush. No. Oh, yes. And so Max has plush lips. And if you are, um, if you don't have that as innate vocabulary, um, if you are coming to this as, oh, this isn't my first language and these words sound very similar, they do both mean soft. Um, lush means the kind of softness that is like pressing a leaf or aloe or this is plush. <laughs> um, so Tom, and, and this has propagated, it has snuck out of Mad Max fandom because um, Venom fandom and Mad Max fandom have a lot of crossovers because Tom Hardy. And so the whole world now thinks that Tom Hardy has velvet lips. <laughs> and if, if you are submitting to something that I'm reading for and you use the word plush to describe something that is lush I know what fandom you read just I actually beware. I have a similar example I've read a lot of Mass Effect fandom fan fiction I'm big in the Mass Effect fandom which is you know what it is and is my there is a particular <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a particular use in one particular pairing a misuse of the word solipsism and you see oh, no. it in fic after fic and I have received a story where someone misused the word in the same way that you only, I have only ever seen it. I have read tens of millions of words of fan fiction and I've only ever seen this word misused in this one fan, in this one pairing, in this one fandom. And it came across my desk and was like, oh, I mean, recognition, but no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And do you, you see that a lot, right? Like whether it's something that is clearly an in-joke between mm -hmm. a writer and their beta readers. Like, yes. I, I hate to say that because like, it's really hard to say why we can spot it, but we can. I was thinking about that in the run up to this, um, you know, the, what overarching problem there is with some tropes that makes me recoil from them or some deployment of some tropes that makes me recoil from them and some that don't how I've occasionally seen a trope that usually I would not appreciate and gone, okay, this really works here. And the thing that I think is, um, every time that you are telling a story, you are trying to connect with your reader. If you are telling it right, that's what you're trying to do. People right. who are a little less studied at writing or um, writing because they've got an ax to grind, they're writing to show off at the, you know, to, to, emote at their reader rather than connect with right so they're lecturing instead of in dialogue right and and when you see the stuff that's obvious in jokes that sort of thing it is the same sort of you are missing a chance to connect and not only are you missing it it's a it's a real misfire because you are doing something you think is clever and you are expecting your reader to say oh how clever that was when really what your reader is going to say oh this person's kind of kind of smug huh and then not not only not connect with you but maybe come up with come away from it uh feeling a little distaste it's hard to sell that too as a as a submissions editor it's hard to push that up the line and say you want to work with the person who wrote this right because, because I think we've all got like rejection nightmares where somebody this is one of the reasons that at yeah right we don't tell necessarily who all our judges are or who was judging around we don't put up who is judge number two or 257 um because we have had some pushback of such vitriol mm -hmm. and it's you are too stupid to understand my story you know 
you are not capable of reading this. I'm like, well, I'm sorry, you submitted to us, bud. Right. When I talk about bouncing a story on the worth of the cover letter, those are two of the other times that I have done it. One of them was a cover letter that said, I understand a submissions editor will be seeing this first, just pass it on up because it's not, I cannot expect that you would fully comprehend it. You don't As, know who your submissions editor is. Right. I know really famous writers who do submissions edits. If you want to shoot yourself in the foot in a whole industry, believe we talk to each other. Right. It, I mean, Go ahead and put your name on something like that. You will not publish. Ever with us. And ever. Honestly, that's fine with me. Right. Because... Because this is this is a I don't relationship work with you. we're trying to have. Yeah. And you don't want a relationship with someone who's abusive. The flip side of that is the one, and I did open the story and go through it. They weren't bounced completely on this, but I knew I was going to bounce them once I read it, where the cover letter started quite normal. And then at about the fourth sentence devolved into, I don't know why I'm even writing this. I know you're never going to publish me. I doubt you're reading this. Why do I keep trying this market? And it's like self-contempt does not endear you to us. We then have to get over this is what you think of your writing before we can feel whatever right. we are naturally going to feel about your writing. You you thought enough of this to send it to us. Just let us have it. Yeah. Just, Just let, let us have it. Trust, trust yourself. Here. Trust yourself. Trust us. Absolutely. Do not apologize for anything you're sending in. If you feel you have to apologize for it, do not send it. Take it back, sit on it for six months, read it to the mirror, tell it to your dog, ask a friend what they think of it. Ask a friend who doesn't like you very much what they think of it. Yeah, it's, it's scalding, but it works. <laughs> I The thing is, I see so many submissions from so many people who, and this this is another thing that I see a lot in fandoms, Um. And I don't like it about fandom. And I think that we can do better as, as fanfic writers um, where people are so hungry for a specific type of story or a specific representation or to feel seen in a story um, that they will forgive almost anything. Mm. Um, or people are so... Um, they like the writer so much as a person that they're not going to tell them, hey, did you know that plush means velvety? We or have, they're just not confident enough for that. We are so. definitely, you know, moved so far on from the fanfic on live journal days at this point. And I mean, I've been reading fics. You shut your Anne Rice loving mouth. <laughs> hand printed Star Trek zines are what I cut my teeth on when it comes to fan fiction. My mother's like Phil Folio illustrated hand printed Star Trek. So I have I have absolutely <coughs> really early in fanfic. But in the live journal days, 15 or 20 years ago now, um, <coughs> criticism was expected and typically welcomed. In fanfic yeah. these days, it is considered a faux pas to point out when someone is saying something wrong. Now, obviously not everyone who's submitting stories is coming from a fanfic background, but more and more, particularly in genre, the people who are submitting stories are coming from fanfic backgrounds. I would say 40 to 60% of the people who submit things have definitely- When you say in genre, you primarily read for sci-fi fantasy. Right? I primarily read for sci-fi fantasy, occasionally horror, um, some slipstream stuff, some, some stuff that's a little farther out there, a, a little gonzo, but um, typically it is sci-fi and fantasy. Yeah. And that is a genre which lends itself well to fan fiction because, of course, most Weird, fanfic huh? is based off of genre movies, televisions, books. Um, yeah. And when people are coming now, particularly the writers who are in their 20s, are coming from this place where they have been told you do not provide critique for the stuff that you read. Getting a cold rejection can be absolutely shattering. And it's not... I want to talk about rejections too for a second because I think a lot of people are going to have that sort of on their mind because we are talking about submissions. Um, one of the things that I tell writers a lot, and I want you to check me on this because we we do read for different markets, um, is that 
rejection isn't necessarily about you. Oh, no. Um, it's not about necessarily the worth of your story, the, the inherent goodness of it. There are so many reasons for rejection that are, we already had our five stories. Um, we already have a story about a robot for this issue. Mm -hmm. um, there were 12 stories about robots and we could only take two. You were one of the 10. Um, your story is not a good fit for our market. Read the market. Um, your story is not a good fit for our editor at this time. Um, and that one, really, you must pay careful attention to your market and to the editor, to the people who are running uh, whatever market you're submitting to, who are human beings, who are living human lives. And particularly right now, when we are going through such a time of upheaval and grief, if you are submitting to a market where this is hypothetical, the head editor has just lost her wife. Right. And you submit a story about someone who has just been widowed. There is a good chance that the submissions editors are not going to pass it up, even if it is very strong. Yeah. Because that would be to inflict harm on the head editor. If your story is very strong, it will find a place at another market. If your story is almost strong enough, it would need, you know, some some work from the editor. We're not going to do that to them. And there's other stuff too, like at Yeah Right, the first couple of nonfiction super challenges we ran starting in early 2020, we said no pandemic stories. Mm -hmm. um, we get that you, this is on your mind. We get that this is a personal essay competition. Um, none of y'all have processed this enough to write about it. Um, neither have we. And we don't, we are not here to be the therapists that you process at because we have our own processing to do. Right. So it's it's one of the reasons that content warnings work well, right? Like oh definitely. How much of a content warning should somebody put on a on a cover letter? I personally have always appreciated um even a couple of words is sufficient. I, I have suffered a baby loss when I was younger, and there is a month out of the year when I cannot read those stories. I simply can't. If I know going into it, this story, CW, miscarriage, then I can pass that one to another, yeah. somebody else. If that hits me, it will not be going up. I yeah. will hit that part in the story, and I simply will not be able to finish it. But that story was assigned to me, so. Yeah. It, those it content is very, warnings make sure good. that... They make sure that the submissions editor that is best able to engage with your work gets yes, your work. Absolutely. And there are people for whom that is no, no injury at all. They could read 15 of those stories a day and it does not touch them because that's not something they've experienced. And that's great. And so that person should be the one who's seeing your story rather than me for whom it's a knife between the ribs for at least that month out of the year. Um, and while certainly I have come across stories that had that in it that were still good. I hit that point and think I cannot finish this, but it should be finished. And then I can release that to another submissions yeah. editor and say, okay, this needs to go back into the pool. It didn't have a content warning. This is what's in it if somebody else would pick it up. But you're looking at another week then before you know whether or not your submission is- Yeah, is you, can, you can save everybody some time and heartbreak. And if somebody doesn't need the content warning, then they don't need it. Right. And and so what? So you've put some extra information and a 10 seconds of extra time into it. Right. I see content warnings for emetophobia or for bugs or for something like that. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Doesn't touch it, me. I appreciate it. It's one of the things that I love coming out of fan fiction, right? Yes. Like people are so used to, hello. Sorry. I had a little kitty cat run through. Um uh so used to now tagging their stories and putting some descriptions of what's going to be in it that um, that we are seeing more and better content warnings, which is terrific. Right. Um, and that's definitely one of the things that I see pushback from authors who came to writing more traditionally. Uh, they might not see how beneficial that is to the community, but having been part of the community of the fan fiction community since well before there were any content warnings, seeing that change in particular and how it has benefited the community. Real glad. Real yeah. glad. 
because yeah. there is nothing like suddenly realizing that you are reading a an incredibly graphic rape scene written by someone who is 14. Yeah. It's like squicky on two different levels. 14-year-olds, I love you. Keep writing. Please keep writing. Please put I'm 14 on this so that I cannot read your sex stories. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. You should be writing what you want to write, what you feel like you should be writing, what, what it is that needs to come out of your heart. Um, just give us the chance to dodge. I'm not advocating that children write porn, everybody, just to get that clear. On the other hand, I have been a child. And you're going to think about what you're going to think about. Children um, are human. I don't need to read it. As an adult, it is creepy for me to read it, not to mention literally illegal. So don't put don't put both of us through that. Right. Thank and you. again, this this still comes back to the whole you're trying to connect with your reader. <laughs> you're not trying to wake them up by the head with a shovel. You're you're trying to connect with your reader. You are not trying to injure them. If you are trying to injure them, and we do see people in every submission period for the magazine I read who are absolutely um, yeah. only submitting because they know that our readers are primarily female and only mm -hmm. submitting because they know that some of our readers are grappling with disabilities or have have backgrounds of various difficulty. Um, and so they submit strictly to hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, we remember their names. I've also seen the people who submit um, very rejectable stories so that they can say they got rejected and make up reasons for that. Yeah. Um, and I will tell you that if you are trying to run that past me or most people I know in any forum that we run, we're going to ask you to say what's in the story and post the story. So we can help, you know? Yeah. I, it, while it so is we can not, help you figure out why. And, it is, you know, <laughs> it is absolutely not within my purview as a submissions editor to ever provide a suggestion. The, the rejection that I send is form because I am not the head editor. I'm not an acquiring editor. And so anything that I said would be as though it came from the magazine. Yeah, I do not have yeah. that level of, of um, discretion. Discretion, right? Yeah. I have my, my personal understanding and my, my, professional understanding of how stories work, but I'm not going to tell you how you could fix it to make it appropriate for this magazine. But separate of my my experiences as a submissions editor, I am editing people's stories for them all the time. Absolutely, you wanna try and get into a community with people who are willing to say, okay, so let me see it and I'll tell you maybe where you went wrong. Yeah, this is also like, people like to tea leaf their submissions a lot um i i see it with our super challenge when people are talking about like oh well i feel like my my feedback from these two judges was really in conflict or i got i got a rejection but it's maybe a little bit personal but i can't is this a form rejection did you get the same rejection i think my my personal favorite um rejection is still one from it's an acquisitions editor rejection from a market that you read for and it says let me see if i can remember exactly how this went i really enjoyed reading this if you ever have anything exactly like it please consider sending it to us so presumably they already had a story about a robot that month yeah Right. But, and we can guess all day, but also as a writer, like my soul, I would rather, I would almost rather get a form rejection. That's just like, okay. And then I can just be like, it's one of the 10 reasons that don't have anything to do with me instead of exactly like this, but not this, <laughs> but exactly like it, but not this. Well, I, I definitely, um, getting specific <coughs> targeted rejections <coughs> is brutal. But it does almost always mean it's passed through at least one set of eyes who said, yeah. okay, this is good. Let's send this on. So, you know. Yeah. Made it past that first round. Right. <sighs> yeah. Okay. So story tropes that I could stand to never see again. The big plot twist. The one where like, they don't care about anything that happens in the story. They just want a big shocker plot twist. Right. They just want and everything is them. writing 
towards the shocker plot twist and telegraphing it so by the time you get there you're like yes the narrator's the murderer thanks right and and this is one of those things that there you know it comes into across two veins right either it is yes the 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 murderer was obvious and we knew it the whole time and maybe don't have them saying sinister things in the first paragraph if you want us to not think they're the murderer or it's the one where there is literally no support the agatha christie and if you go sorry back, i went off on agatha christie last month i've had i have had stories submitted where the last page had a just hard right turn and i've gone back to the beginning and looked for any support for this and found none um, and not just no support, but like stuff that makes this hard right turn impossible, like literally impossible. It would be right. so far out of character for a character that we are in tight third person with. Right. While unreliable narrators can be really interesting, there has to be proof they're unreliable beyond the big final twist. You have to sort of pepper that in there along the way, because otherwise it isn't the narrator that is unreliable, it's the author. And the author gotcha. needs to be unimpeachable in terms of reliability. You need to trust the author or you are not going to be able to connect with your unreliable narrator in such a fashion that their unreliability is interesting. It just comes off as, as dangerous to the reader. And this is another, I think, trope that we see a lot of, because um, the way that you said that brought, brought up all of the tropes that we talk about as being you know, lazy writing, or um, thoughtless writing, careless writing, um, coding disability as the villain, coding queerness as the villain, coding ugliness as the villain, coding fatness as the villain, all of these things. Um, when you throw in misogyny, I have edited more than one story that is supposed to be entirely about a man's relationship with a woman in which the woman is neither named nor described in the entire story. Mm -hmm thousands of words about this guy and his feelings about this woman and she doesn't get a name they call um, that one that's the sexy lamp right yeah it's that's a sexy the lamp. TV tropes word for it if you could replace the female character with an unmoving untalking lamp then i mean she does things we just don't know what she looks like or what her name is no internal motivation no possibility that she exists unless he's looking at her yeah and so I have had author pushback when I was editing some of these stories um, that say, well, I want this character to be unlikable. And I'm like, you're not making the character unlikable writing it this way. Right. And the thing that you're doing by putting some of these tropes in is jeopardizing, as you said, the, the reader's trust. Right. The, the is this the character or is this the author's shitty opinion and there are ways to show that it is the character rather than the author's shitty opinion and there are ways to do it fairly simply um right it doesn't have to be an after school universe. special if if one character responds to the crummy misogynistic you know body shaming or whatever yeah. main character if somebody else side eyes and is like you know treats them more coldly even if they don't straight out say hey that behavior is not cool if their treatment of the character changes then we know that this is about the character and it's not about the author right their treatment of that character could change their responses to people that that character has impacted could change right. what you don't want to do is set up a hermione problem where Hermione calls out slavery and is then ridiculed by every other character in the book because Joe Rowling is classist. And then nothing ever changes. And then nothing ever changes because the slaves are happy. Except right. for Dobby because Master gave Dobby a sock and Dobby immediately decides that what he wants to do is serve Master. Yeah, I could talk about Dobby for an hour or two, so I won't. Oh, Dobby. <laughs> but it's... Um... Make sure that they know that it's in the story and not in you. We betray ourselves constantly with what we write. Um, uh, yes. I, I illustrated a very, very, very small comic when I was in my mid-20s. And I was going through some things in my mid-20s. And I stumbled on the panels in my early 30s and went, wow, this is bald. At the time, I thought it was really um, elegantly 
plotted and I thought the metaphors were so, you know, couched under someone. And I'm like, no, this is just, this isn't subtext. This is text. Yeah. So it's one of those things that is helpful, again, to have a community around you where you can say, okay, read this character and tell me who you think this character is from their behavior. Do you want to be stuck in an elevator with this person? Right. What of these characters traits do you see in me? <laughs> Does this seem like it's just an, just an XP for myself? Or are they sufficiently distant from me? Oh, here's and a trope I could never see again. The writer constantly describing the character and the, the characters around them's reactions to the character in a way that is completely inconsistent with the way the character looks and acts. Give me an example. Twilight. Oh, okay. Well, Bella yes. Twilight is an objectively is attractive, intelligent person who... Or, you know, the most famous Twilight fanfic, Fifty Shades, right. um, uh, where Anna is constantly, is it Anna or Anna? Bella. I don't Bella and Twilight. I don't remember. Yeah. Um, anyway, where anorexia is, um, you know, she's in there and and I don't think I really don't think that it's like a coincidence that their names are the shortcuts for anorexia and bulimia, but that's a separate conspiracy theory. Oh, I'll think about that every time I see it now. Sorry, not sorry. Um, so, um, so you get this description of someone who is objectively beautiful and everyone's like, you're so plain. Right. And, and they are a conventionally attractive thin white woman and and everyone around them is just responding as though they are horrifying um, so I definitely think that's the author telling on themselves somewhat yeah. in that they are attempting to describe a character that's very different from themselves but can only describe the experiences of a character that's very similar right or the experiences of a character that is aspirational to them mm -hmm. like here's I can tell when you're writing yourself insert guys. I can tell. Right. There's the whole classic problem. I'm okay with really, it. It's it's very difficult to write someone who's a lot smarter than you because yeah. then you have to show them being smart. And this is certainly something I have personally encountered. If I want to write somebody who's crazy good at something, then I have to have a passing understanding of what being good looks like so that I can at least describe it. And this is another another way so, that it's good to have good to have somebody else read and make sure that no more using loving chess as a shortcut for being smart please yes. please yes. please for one thing chess is largely about memorization and for another we live in such a digital world at this point there are many other ways to show many other ways to show intelligence there are and it's, and it's so expression. many ways and if you don't if you don't know any other ways to show intelligence find the smartest person you know and just look at what they're doing even look up the smartest person you've heard of and look at their home life on section on wikipedia and see what they're into their home life their hobbies find a find a ted talk they gave about something they're passionate about Mm -hmm. Same thing with any area of expertise, whether it's computer science, whether it's gay sex, which is currently largely being written by young women. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be very, very open. Gay romance is largely being written by young cis het women. If you have not had anal sex and you are writing about a lot of anal sex, you need a very good beta reader or some lube. Well, I mean, this is what sensitivity readers are for, <laughs> right? You can pay yeah. people for this. You can say, I need, I'll, I have 50 bucks. Can you give me 15 minutes? You know, can you give me 30 pages of like reading? Yeah. And this is something that, that Kat and I talk about a lot. Um, folks, if you don't know who Kat is, she's been a repeat panelist here. Go look at her panel in May. Um, she did a panel on sensitivity readers uh, last year in, I cannot remember when, was it? July, August, um, Christine will figure it out for me and then tell me and then I will tell you. Um, but uh, she and I talked a lot in the, the weeks leading up to our sensitivity readers panel. You can get 
sensitivity reader type information for very inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Go take someone who knows something to coffee. Right. I mean, the while it is Wear not masks possible, sit outside, you know, or get on get on Zoom, get a chat, figure out how to compensate them for their time, but run your ideas past them early. Right. get a gut check, you can do that for less than 20 bucks and it can save your entire story. July. Okay. Um, yeah. So, there, yeah. I have you certainly, uh, working with novel writing workshops, working with that sort of thing, I've certainly seen people who have a really good idea, they think. Um, yeah. For example, writing about suicides in one particular forest in Japan, and they think that it's really, you know, this white person who has never been to Japan and speaks no Japanese really wants to write this horror novel set in a place yeah. of tragedy in another country. And I approached that person very gently and said, okay, I am not Japanese. I speak a moderate amount of Japanese and I can put you in touch with people, but I think this is a bad idea. Can we just make up a place? Yeah. Does it have to be there? And the result was good. She's like, right. oh, I hadn't considered that actually. And right. here's all the additional work that you have to put into making this a real thing. Why don't we just take the aspects of this that interest you and set it someplace you're competent? Yeah. Put it in Maine. Yeah. Don't put it in Maine. <laughs> don't put it in Maine. Put it anywhere but Maine. You can't put it in Maine. Stephen King took it. It's gone. Oh, okay. It's gone. All right. Put it off the Blue Ridge somewhere then. Yeah. Talk to me. I can tell you where to put it locally. <laughs> Don't set it in the Superstition Mountains. Why have we, the 500 stories I think I've read this year set in that, did something happen? Like, was it in the news? Yes, um, there was, I believe it was the Superstitions in uh, a policeman murdered his girlfriend by, by leaving her alone when she didn't know where to go. And okay. she died by dehydration a year ago or two years ago. I think it was the Superstitions. Um, Maybe. So, I mean, it also just has a really evocative name. Yeah. I mean, and there, it's a lovely, incredible mountain range. Uh, we also but... got a bunch set in like Northern Idaho for a while. And I just, I feel like these things get into the, into the zeitgeist. But if you are thinking about something specific because of a news story, move it. Yes. Set it someplace that you're more familiar with. Set it someplace you have a gut level understanding of. We say this a lot in the super challenge. I, I say, we say this a lot in the super challenge a lot. Don't take the chance that your submissions editor knows more about the thing you're writing about than you. Right. Like a lot more, a lot, a lot more. Uh, my classic example is I got a story set in the Idaho panhandle that talked about the rolling hills of the Idaho panhandle. Much like that's, the green is the cabinet the mountains. Yeah. It's literally the Rockies. It is steep. It is forested. It is craggy. It is beautiful. It is one of my favorite landscapes. Um, if it wasn't so full of Nazis, I could buy a house there cheerfully. Um, it what it does not have is rolling plains, and you can get on Google Earth and see that. Mm -hmm. Like there's no there's no excuses right now. There's no like my own private Idaho idea that you had since you were five that Idaho is farmland and has potatoes in it like just get on satellite view you're fine right and similar to you know if it's something you saw and you got an idea um I am absolutely certain that next read period I will be receiving several score stories about AI gone wrong oh yeah don't write about something that's in the news today everyone is going to be writing about it. While ideas are individual to the author, it is very, very rare for an idea to be so individual that no one else is writing it while you're writing it. Right. And again, if we get 10 stories about AI gone wrong, or in the case of a big market, like oh, Strange Horizons, like Uncanny, 10,000 stories about AI gone wrong, and we can take one of them, if you're the only person writing a story about a robot, how much better did your odds just get? Right. If you're the only person writing a story about a grandma and a cuckoo clock, how much better did your odds just get? 
And you have to consider when you are submitting to a place that has an open read period, typically those places also do requested submissions, right? They'll approach an author that they like yeah. and they'll say, do you have anything about a robot? Um, when we're talking about stuff that's just happening right now, it's a lot more likely that story is going to be accepted from the person who's already got two Hugo Awards and is a yep. known yep. quantity when it comes to writing things that are really close to experiences people are currently having. Whereas you and the 75 other people who are going to write me a story about how chat GPT wakes up and murders your cat in the morning, you're not going to make it because the person who we requested that story from has already provided it to us. You need to step right. back. Mara Jennison's already over here writing the AI story that you want to publish. Right. Don't be writing that story, you can't compete with her. I love her. Right. And while I will absolutely say, if you have a story in you, don't not write it because you're worried somebody else is going to write it. Right. You will yeah. find a place for it. Sit on it. Yeah. Sit on it for six months. Sit on it for two years. I know people who have been See working the on the same. I, I, there, there are authors who I know who are prolific, but have gone back to the same short story to tinker with it repeatedly over a decade before they're like, this story is now what I want it to be. And in, the, in that intervening time, they've written 60 other stories that have gotten published. Yeah, But that one wasn't there. It was too timely when it was written. So they sat on it until time had passed. And we're all able to look back at that news event with more educated eyes and tell a story about it that's a little more nuanced. Right. Yeah. Let's see, what else? I know you and I sat down and listed some stuff. And I'm, I'm trying to make sure that we get to all the stuff that we talked about, because I loved everything that you said. And I know we've gotten to most of it. Oh, expected phrases, not just not just the plush lips, but like there's phrasing that people carry forward out of fandom that is number one. Um, once something gets into a fandom zeitgeist, the odds that it is a copyrighted line from a comic that you just haven't read, real high. Real high. Real high. The odds that your submissions editor is going to recognize what comic that's from, also real high. You've now made yourself unpublishable. And Make sure you're say, not using those phrases. You certainly hope your submissions editor recognizes it. And if they don't recognize it, you certainly hope that the acquisitions editor recognizes it. Because the author will recognize it. The yeah. original writer will recognize it, and they've got a blog. Especially if it's a really evocative line the more you love a line that someone put in a fanfic I think honestly the less you want to try to call back to it both right. because it's an in-joke and we just talked about why you don't want to do that but also because the odds that it's not yours and not theirs um, are exponential and you can set yourself and the magazine up. You can set yourself up for lifelong reputation for plagiarism when you had no intent of doing that. You don't want to be one of those people the kids make fun of on Tumblr for doing something that's so easily avoidable, right? Right. And, and oh my God, speaking of Tumblr, whatever the Tumblr thing of the month is, don't write about that. Please, please don't. I, I, um, I write short fic on Tumblr just to kick the spiders out of my head. And several of those have gone mildly viral, you know, 5,000 to, 5, to 30,000 reblogs. And there are always people in comments saying, you should write this as a novel. They're like, no, no, this is a for, short form for this market, for this venue. And yeah. it works really well here. It will not work trying to take it to another space. It will not yeah. work trying to make it into another thing. You have to recognize. Don't when... reference that famous Tumblr fic. Don't, don't take you know, gods, deities, the the one with the grandma and the demon. Right. Every time. But leave it be. Every time. But leave it. Leave it there. Leave it there. Let it. Let it go around and and get me as a meme every time. Right. Um, and, and because. First of all, that story belongs to somebody. Yeah. Just because everybody reads to, reads it and a lot of social media allows you to sort of add on, 
whether it's through stitching on TikTok or through reblogging and adding things on Tumblr or through joining a tweet thread and adding your own comments, um, it doesn't belong to you. That part of it might belong to you. The thing that you write might belong to you, but the base thing, you can't get paid for something that you can't determine copyright for. As a lawyer, it is my duty to inform you, copyright inheres on creation. The minute a work is fixed in a tangible medium, which means on a disk anywhere, on a server anywhere, on paper anywhere, the copyright belongs to its creator. If you are making fanfic of that, if you are tagging onto it, you are creating what's known as a derivative work. It can be a licensed or unlicensed derivative work. License can or can't be inferred from context. Something like in Tumblr, where it's very customary for people to tag on, your derivative work is probably licensed, but the only part that's yours is the derivative work. And riding off of that, the instant that you post it to Tumblr, to Twitter, to Facebook, to TikTok, it is published. Meaning, and if, if you submit it to me, if you submit yep. it to me, I can't take it because now it's a reprint and we don't do those. And it doesn't matter if your blog has 10 viewers. It doesn't matter if somebody clicks through accidentally, sees four sentences of the story and goes, I was looking for the thing on fish and leaves. That is published now legally. Yep. And you have to say so. You can't say this is new and unpublished because while the while link rot is real, if somebody so has is the way back machine. The Wayback Machine, and and I'm sure I read this somewhere, and the people will find out. And yeah. then you've made yourself again unpublishable. Yeah. The, you are, so, you are, when you submit things, you are attempting to build a relationship, not just between you and the reader who will eventually read it, but between the market and the editors who function with that market and everyone the editors talk to. You're, you are inserting yourself into this web of interrelationships, and you do not walk into somebody's house and kick a lamp over. You have yeah. to know how to behave. Yeah. And that said, different markets have different rules on what published means. Many, many markets say if this was just on your blog and you take it down, we don't consider it published or we don't consider your private blog to have been published for purposes of our submission. What here are the rights that we want? Here are the rights that we don't want. If somebody wants rights of first publication, though, you cannot have put it on your blog first. You full, full stop cannot. Right. Um, think about think about your rights as an author. Think about whether you want audio rights. Think about whether you want republication rights. Think about whether you want. So there's a lot of, you know, what what is first publication? What can this market do with your with your stuff? What do you want them to do with your stuff? And how exciting is it that you're going to get published? Congratulations. Um, because that's good too. Like I don't want to say like you like here's all the roadblocks, but like the the end game here is is to get you published. Right. And I certainly don't want to be coming off um, making you think that submissions editor editors are your adversaries. We're not. We're the last said, bastions yeah. of hope in the universe. We want good <laughs> writing, please. Every time writing. that I get a story, because like I said, I only get twenty to thirty stories get rejected and one gets sent up. Every time I get one that I can send up, send up, I am on our back channel Discord, exulting, saying, "Look, right, look, look. Like, I will call people who like have the right to read the story, even though they don't have to read the story as part of their work, and I'll be like, "Bro, did you see this thing?" Right, and and we are all really happy. And then when a story that we sent up is one of the ones that the editors eventually choose that gets published, it like yeah, it's a really good feeling. Like oh. I saw that one. I saw that one. I said yes to that. And they yeah. agreed with me. <laughs> you know, so right. we are but not. I don't think it matters who you are. I don't, I don't think it matters how many Hugas you get or how famous you get or it's. I don't think so. Everybody, everybody's like still at that. Like I spotted that. Yeah. That's me. I got to see that first. My eyes were on that first. And it's a very good feeling. And all of us want to have that. Um, it's, we are definitely not here as your enemy, but so I practice a martial art and, and I've got a couple of black belts in my, mar in that martial art. And it is a, it is an understood thing that your first rank of black belt, they are looking for reasons to pass you. 
your third rank of black belt, they are looking for reasons for you to fail. When you are dealing with a market that is pro level, they aren't looking for reasons you should go on. They're looking for the reasons that you aren't going to make it. When you're dealing with semi-pro or below that, frequently they're willing to overlook things that are a little not right because they can work that with that with you later. But just because of the sheer volume that pro markets get, we love you. We love the whole world of publishing and of the genre and all these stories that are coming in. And we're so glad you exist. But like the sensei who looked at me putting my left foot down when I shouldn't and went fail, who has known me 15 years, loving me is not sufficient to get me through when I don't, I, when I haven't actually made it. On reasons to fail, just to sort of touch one last thing, um, because we are running right up against time here. Um, missing explanations using a trope to substitute for an explanation that is necessary in the story it is so wasteful you have 5000 words you have 7000 words you have 10000 words every one of those words is an opportunity for you to tell the story more completely if you just elide it, expecting that if you stick this little trope in here, people are going to recognize where you're coming from, which again, not to not to take it back to fan fiction too often, but that's definitely something that is part of how fan fiction functions. And yeah, and I think it's also an in-genre thing because we all get so used to reading and writing in genre that we're like, well, of course, like if you look at like a final girl trope, right? Like right. you can set that up really easily now as long as you are writing in horror for horror readers right and we'll recognize it but it has to not be done out of a sense of ease yeah it has to not be done to save you the work of actually telling the story if it isn't working for you then it is working against you if you're trying to save words to tell your story with by using tropes to substitute for fuller explanations. And I'm not talking about like heaps and heaps and heaps of backstory, but I'm talking about like giving the actual reason that someone is bad instead of just making him use racial slurs all the time. Mm -hmm. um, if you are using, I guarantee you are wasting other words you have wasted space that you're trying to save here. Go find that wasted space. It's probably an in-joke. Take it out, mm -hmm. fill it up with this explanation. Right. And this is similar, you know, uh, I read genre. I love genre. So obviously I'm well acquainted with adverbs appearing very heavily in published works, but you still do your best to trim down the adverbs because they weaken your verbs, right? This is the sort of thing that weakens not just that sentence, but it weakens the fabric of the whole story when you do it. And if you're right. going to deploy a trope, you want it to be something that makes you stronger. Not I am something strongly that... pro adverb. I should I should say, what I am not is pro adverbs that all modify the same verb. Okay. Yeah. Valid. Because if you're going to say he smiled cheerfully, he smiled thinly, he smiled angrily he smiled with through gritted teeth you have weakened smile to the point where it's meaningless mm. and this it's the same thing with the tropes right like you have now weakened this character to the point where they're meaningless by surrounding them with tropes right. let them grin smile thinly smile through clenched teeth and just say something cheerfully basically if you don't, don't trust you smile four times you have to yeah. trust your character to do the heavy lifting if you yeah. don't then the story needs to be reworked the character needs to be reworked something along those lines and as far as the repetition thing that's my own personal my biggest pet peeve is when i can control f for a word and find it 17 times in 5000 words probably and i don't mean obviously the words you use constantly the the filler words the piecing together no, words. my word is shrug right I, shrug. I literally know your word chortle know your word is you know chortle only gets to appear once in a story if you use it 
unless yes. the character is a little, you know, very unusual and doing something irritating. So the old guard um, fandom, I need you to stop using the phrase shit eating grin. Yes. Yeah. Which is very specific to an actual, you know, animal face and not there everybody is, can do it. There is a specific context. No, many people can just grin. There yeah. is like a story, there's a narrative context that generates that specific expression. Right. And, and also you... y'all need to stop using it for like a year anyway, um, so that it can work its way out of the zeitgeist. But it, this is the same thing, right? Like know your personal phrase. Um, sh like I said, shrugs, shrugs and grins. Um, and I will do a control F in my own work. Mm -hmm. And you can take snip sentences out of your out of your work and put the first half of the sentence into a Google search. Does it autocomplete? Change it. God. Yeah. Yep. Um, what else? Oh, ways that we show emotion. I mentioned the single tear. Um, dramatic eating disorders. <sighs> if I never read a dramatic eating disorder again, I would be so thrilled. Yeah. And single not like a story where a character has an eating disorder, but if a character exhibits disordered eating patterns throughout your entire story that is an eating disorder and it should be called out and dealt with if your character stops eating every time something upsetting happens in their life they are anorexic and they need therapy and this isn't one of those things that needs to be saturday morning special right like it doesn't have yeah. to be fixed let it another character notice let them and, notice. Let somebody say, hey, I'm going to check in on you and make sure you're eating the next couple of days, okay? Right. And and I mean, you can do this subtly. They don't have to say it outright. Every time the every time the neighbor in the hall sees that you come now, they're like, oh, I made you cookies. Oh, I made you soup. So now yeah. you're building that character up and you're building up their response to this character and you're never stating outright, this character has been recognized by somebody else as having a problem. You are you are giving it to us without needing to baldly state it. That works too. Yeah, yeah. As a stress bar for also that can that can leave stories forever. Yeah, I mean certainly it, there are going to be things that every individual it's real. reader. It's real. It's realistic. It's absolutely realistic. But I I have certainly like that doesn't need to be the way everybody talks about stress if you habitually use stress vomiting in your stories or i was so upset i felt nauseous or whatever i encourage you to go rewatch the good place because chidi is nauseous every time he's stressed out and it's expressed a different way every time and they do a good job with it like it is a real tell for his stress level Right. But it's not just, and then I barfed and then I barfed. Because as someone who does stress vomit, I got to tell you, it will take a toll on you. Right. The, the, none of this stuff occurs in a vacuum, right? The, it isn't like The Sims, like algorithmically, your character is going to do this thing. And now they're going to do this other thing. That's not how people function. We flow from one event to another, one action to another. And what we have done previously has an effect on what happens next. This stuff isn't, isn't so episodic that you can say, all right, this happened. And then there was a chunk of time where nothing occurred. And then this happens. Yeah. You have to be able to show emotion. Oh, that's the other one. Um, injuries. There are ways you can write about them and ways that you can't, particularly when a lot of your readers are going to be related to doctors or martial artists or themselves martial artists or have suffered chronic injuries or have suffered acute injuries that took a long time to get over or simply because all of us are either disabled or pre-disabled moving through age toward the point where injury is a constant factor of their life while it's certainly I not can tell immediately reading an injury story reading a fight scene whether the person has ever been ever. seriously injured and if you've never been seriously injured run this past someone because you don't just walk some things off right you get your knee kicked out there's six months in surgery 
you get hit in the head and knocked unconscious, if you lose consciousness, that's for certain a concussion. That's how that happens. Like that, that is how the unconsciousness happens. You don't have to go unconscious to get a concussion. You can just stand up into a shelf like I did. And then four years later, still be wobbly when you try and stand on one foot. But if you get, if you get shot, you will all, be in shock. Yes. It doesn't matter if you got shot someplace important. You shot, will be in stabbed, shock. Even fairly gently hit by a car. You get hit Small by a car. Dog bites. Did you know yeah. that the, getting bit by a dachshund will put you into shock? And there's varying you levels of how that loss. is expressed. Yeah. You know, you might not get the shivers every time you go into shock, but you could be loopy. You could be nauseous. You could just make bad decisions for a while. Yep. Yeah. And, and we are. But the body carries the that world. trauma and it's going to carry it into the next scene. Yeah. At least the next scene. Conceivably, you know, the next book. Yeah. And it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be a big thing. It doesn't have to be a big telegraphed, you know, and now I'm thinking about my mother for the rest of the story because I hit my head so hard and she hit her head and I saw it went, you know, it doesn't have to be yeah. like that, but it does have to inform their actions from then on out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we are, we are definitely at time, if not a little bit over. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Um, let's blather for a second so I can make sure that we don't have any additional questions or anything else that we need to clear up. Let me give that about five minutes in which we just, I don't know, ramble on. Um, but, oh God, the injuries thing. I am so tired of the injuries. And I recognize that I am incredibly privileged there as someone who is related to a medical professional who um, has a disabled spouse um, who became disabled through injuries, um, who has done a martial art, who has been injured, you know, like we have, but you know, somebody who's been hurt for Pete's sake, you know, someone, you, you definitely you talk. If you don't think, you know, someone talk to somebody in Gen X, we've all been hurt. We drank from the hose. We fell out of the car. We've all been hurt. We, yep. We've got you. This is our moment. Let us I have it. pushed a wagon down a cliff once in Arizona. Sandstone, dad, very fragile, it turns out. My dad lived in one of those old houses in Connecticut that has the stairs down to the door. And he okay. saw in the theater the Peter Pan with Mary Martin, where you can see the wires. And he got all of his good thoughts together and he made a cape out of one of the upstairs curtains. And he remembers running down the hall and he remembers hitting the bottom. And he says he will feel cheated for his entire life that he doesn't remember what flying was like. My great grandfather was an airman in World War II. He came home with his parachute. My grandfather thought parachutes are very neat and went up onto oh, no. the roof on the roof with the parachute on and jumped off. Now the house was two stories and the That's straps on the parachute. The straps on a parachute are two stories. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. are. Yeah, that eight-year-old hit like an eight-year-old's gonna hit a sidewalk, broke both legs, I believe he broke. Yeah. And that's a story that informed the rest of his life. By the yeah. time that I met him, you know, very much an adult. By the time that I was born, my mother was the, the middle of his kids and obviously an adult. Um he no longer suffered aches and pains from that injury, but it certainly, you could see in him the fact that at eight years old, he had to spend a summer and a half in yeah. bed. It yeah, changed absolutely. his personality in subtle ways, you know? Yeah. That sort of thing. Let, let what happens in your, oh my God. Yeah. So um, trope, naming, same thing as in jokes, right? Calling out famous characters. Um, Getting so putting together a naming scheme where all of your characters are named after famous large mountains or other writers or oh I'm gonna pass number one some of these things are still in copyright. Um, number two, yeah, you could hypothetically be writing something steampunk and have Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Watson walk by, but again, you're wasting space for your story. Right. If you have to rest on the shoulders of giants who have come before to maintain interest in your story, 
don't don't shop it yet. It is time to pull some things out and put some things yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm um, going to I'm going to wind us down and thank you uh for coming and chattering to us and I'm sorry I took up so much of the your space. No, it was fun. So, um I hope I hope you'll consider coming back to see us. I know we've already floated a couple of workshop ideas that I think are really exciting that I think that people are going to be excited for. So y'all stay tuned for, for more about that as we get things put together. Thank you everyone for being here and have a, have a great month. We will see you in July. Absolutely. Thank you.